From electric cars to spaceships to social media, Elon Musk is constantly getting into our heads. So maybe it shouldn't come as a surprise that Musk now wants to actually get into our heads. His company called Neuralink has been racing to develop a brain implant that can convert a person's thoughts into a range of commands a computer can understand. After testing on animals, the company is now seeking a volunteer for its first human clinical trial. And if the product works as intended, one day it could conceivably improve the lives of people suffering from paralysis, stroke, and hearing and vision loss. Of course, Musk being Musk, he also has a more out there motivation for racing to complete this device. Elon's vision, this is a guy who's consumed by the idea that AI might go amok, might leave the human race behind. And so in this very futuristic version of this tech, we would become these human-machine hybrids where information could go into our brains, sort of matrix style, like you download Kung Fu or you download Spanish, and then information would go out. Maybe you could send your thoughts directly to another person. That's Bloomberg Business Week reporter Ashley Vance. He's been covering Neuralink for years, including 10 trips to the company's facilities in California and Texas. He's gotten to watch the place and its founder in action. Ashley's here to tell us what he found inside what's arguably Elon Musk's most ambitious and controversial project. Is this the most sort of stable, pragmatic, judicious guy that you want to be in control of a world of mind control devices? Probably not. Is he the person that will probably be the first to sort of make this happen? Yes. I'm Wes Kosova. That's today on The Big Take. Hey, Ashley, good to see you again. Thank you for having me. So you've had a pretty interesting time lately taking a look at Elon Musk's big project, Neuralink. And you called it the most consequential product launch of his career. That's kind of like a big statement given everything that this guy has done. You can read that in a few different ways, I guess. In one sense, Neuralink is this brain implant, and so it's a, it's a medical device. And look, I mean, rockets and cars are serious business, but in the past, these companies have messed up on their first product launches. SpaceX had rockets blow up. Tesla struggled for years and years and years to mass produce its car. You had some room for error to get these things right. The U.S. Food and Drug Administration is taking a very close look at Neuralink. And and so this is going to go into a human for the first time after many years of animal trials. And so, you know, there's a lot of pressure. And then for the rest of us, I mean, the sort of exciting and possibly scary thing about all this is this device really could be this incredible piece of technology that one day, in the near term, it's going to help people with illness. One day, maybe it makes us all these human-machine hybrids. And so there's a lot at stake here, you know, maybe the future of the human species. Tell us about Neuralink, exactly what it is and what Musk hopes that the thing is going to do. This company started in 2016. It's always had pretty much the same goal, which is basically to put a computer chip into people's brains. And the reason you would do this is to, you essentially put a, electrodes right up against neurons in our brain and you can watch brain activity. As neurons fire, they fire in certain patterns depending on what you're doing. And so the big idea is to read this brain activity, put it through AI algorithms and all kinds of other software and come to some insights about the brain. In the near term, this would be things like people who are paralyzed or have ALS or or strokes and are having trouble speaking or having trouble using a computer. This device would be able to read their thoughts. They would think what they want to do on a computer, think about navigating a web page or typing what they want to say, and the brain implant would send those signals out and it would get translated onto a computer. So sort of amazing. Elon's vision, this is a guy who's consumed by the idea that AI might go amok, might leave the human race behind. And so in this very futuristic 
version of this tech, we would become these human machine hybrids. So Neuralink has been working on an implant to make this happen. As far as I follow all these companies, it's, it's the most advanced, powerful, and invasive implant that anyone's ever built. In this space, I guess they call it the brain-computer interfaces, or BCIs, has been pretty busy. And Neuralink has a lot of competition that, at the moment at least, seems like they're a little bit ahead of Musk. I follow this field closely, and, and there's, two, there's two big competitors that at least Elon Musk has been most concerned about in the meetings that I've watched. And one company is called Synchron. They're headquartered in New York. They have a brain implant. It does not require a craniectomy to have your skull cut open. They actually, it's like a stent, similar to a, a stent that would go in your heart. They thread this stent through your, your arteries into a blood vessel in the brain. And for years now, they started in Australia and are now in New York. They have many people, dozens of people who have, have had this implant. Essentially, the person kind of thinks it's almost like a binary on or off as to what you want to do on a computer. Do you want to select this letter? Do you want to select this word? Do you want to click your mouse here? And the people think, and, and that happens. And some listeners might remember, we went to visit Synchron back in March, and I spoke to the company's CEO, Thomas Oxley. Here's a bit of that. On the Apple iPhone, there is a way in which you can start to control the iPhone without having to touch the screen if you have an ability to send command clicks into the iPhone. So we have um, our patients sending their command functions and we've integrated into the iPhone where they're able to navigate their way and use the iPhone. It's not as fast as what you and I can do with our fingers, but Apple have created um, mechanisms of accessibility control that allow these types of inputs to work. So that's a really big deal. We're giving our patients back control over the iPhone. And if you'd like to listen to that show, there's a link in the episode notes. There's another company based in Switzerland called Onward. They are not in the brain, they are on the spine. They put an implant right on a person's spine. And I have seen in person in Switzerland, it's one of the most amazing things I've ever seen, a fully paralyzed person, this Italian gentleman named Michelle. He'd been paralyzed for three years from a car accident. He, he walked again right in front of me. It's not a totally natural gait, but this is a person who's standing up, walking across rooms. Another young woman, Julie, she was paralyzed in a car accident. And when you're paralyzed, often you have trouble regulating your blood pressure. And it used to take her seven hours to get out of bed each day. She would pass out so many times. And she had this implant and it's totally changed her life. And so what is the difference between what these companies that seem to be a bit ahead of Neuralink are doing and what Neuralink aims to do once they're able to implant the device? So in a lot of ways, some of these startups are tackling very specific problems. You know, Synchron is giving you this amazing but sort of limited access on your computer. Onward has about a dozen electrodes on the spine. Neuralink is looking to put dozens, if not hundreds, of electrodes into the brain. So it's, it's just this massive increase in computing horsepower. And they want to be, you could think of it as like a general purpose computing system. So it's not just doing words. It's not just the spine. They want, to, they want to link a brain implant with a spinal implant. They want to do speech. They want to do movement. They want to restore feeling to people's limbs. They want to have people walk again. They want to, you know, restore vision. I mean, sort of do everything. And it's through having this extra computing horsepower that they would be able to, to pull all these things off. Can you describe exactly what it would take to get one of these Neuralink implants into a person's brain. So from the start, Elon wanted this to be something closer to like a consumer electronics device. And so the way Neuralink does its surgery is, is a human surgeon for the moment cut a hole in the skull. And then Neuralink has built this rather amazing robot that has a tiny, tiny, tiny needle. And it grabs these threads, is what Neuralink calls them. They're wires with electrodes on them. And the robot peers through this hole in the skull with, with all kinds of computer vision, software, and cameras. And then it pushes these threads into your brain. And after it's done that with 64 of these threads in this first human trial that'll start in just a matter of weeks, then the hole in your skull is 
plugged up, for lack of a better term, with Neuralink's computing device that has a battery, it has wireless communications to send the signals out, and then it has all of this computing systems to read the signals in your brain. And that device goes flush with your skull. When I've seen primates and pigs that have had this implant, you couldn't tell which animal has had the implant and which hasn't. How long does it take for the robot to implant all of these wires in the device itself? The actual surgery would take two to three hours when you take into account being anesthetized and the surgeons getting ready to go into the OR and prepping the patient. Once the robot sets to work, it's about a 25-minute procedure. They've done it as quick as 18 minutes. The faster, the better, because it does less damage to the brain and the recovery is quicker. And in the future, you know, Elon's vision for this is that we we all show up at like a, a clinic or some sort of store and you go in and the robot does everything and it takes about 10 or 15 minutes and, and you leave with a, a chip in your head and, and a new, 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 more advanced human. While you're waiting for your Tesla to get charged in right. the parking lot. <laughs> After the break, what's it like to work at Neuralink? Ashley, you've spent a lot of time at Neuralink. There are two big facilities, I guess, one's in California and one's in Texas, watching this operation and watching Elon Musk. What's it like there? I've been going for about three years. I'm the only reporter, I'm pretty sure, that's ever been allowed in there. It's fascinating. As with all of Elon's companies, you know, he has a gift for assembling very smart people and having them charge toward a goal and Neuralink is no different. I mean, th these are world-class engineers in this room. This company is a little odd in that Elon only pops in about once a month to come check out what's going on and it's ostensibly run by a triumvirate of people. And so Elon will show up and everybody briefs him on the latest of what's happening with the company. I, I went to a couple meetings, I found them sort of funny. Typically, Elon will stand at the head of this table and eight to 10 top engineers will be gathered around it and they start presenting on what's going on. And in Elon, he's actually surprisingly adept. He knew a lot about brain science, about the implant technologies, about the rivals. I was actually quite surprised. I was, on one hand, kind of impressed with his knowledge in this field. Just as he did with rockets in, in self-driving cars, Elon seems to learn by osmosis from talking to all of his engineers and actually digest these facts and, and can talk in quite detail about what's going on in the brain and with these implants. On the other hand, you know, sometimes he comes up with suggestions for the device and you can tell the engineers aren't quite convinced that it's going to work or that he knows what he's talking about. And so, you know, in the story, I described this as when I would witness these moments as Elon sort of having this like PhD in self-confidence. I mean, he's not afraid to share his opinion and the engineers kind of let it wash over them and, and nod and then go back to whatever they're doing. But then Elon will jump in and his commandment pretty much always is to move faster. And, and this has made people nervous. Again, this is a biotech device. This might be an area where you don't want to move faster. So in one meeting, I, I saw this firsthand. The engineers had gone through a demo that Neuralink was planning to do. And Elon says to them, we want to get there with a maniacal sense of urgency. Maniacal, like the world is coming to an end. We need to get there before the AI takes over, or at least try. And this was not a unusual, out of the blue remark. I, I went to several meetings and this was a common refrain. Another big moment of friction that you describe is when one of the people at Neuralink said it was going to take a long time for the FDA to approve this device. Yeah, and it wasn't even just to approve the device. It was once we get our first human trial, the FDA wants us to wait a year before we do another implant. And Elon just blurts out, unacceptable. 
that cannot happen. We want to we want to be going into more humans as quickly as we can. And and so he starts advising the engineers on how this is going to play out in his mind. And he says, look, I've been at SpaceX where we battle against the Federal Aviation Administration to get permits to launch our rockets and try new prototypes. And as long as we can show that this works and make some progress, the FDA will bend to our will and let us do more of these. So he, you know, he tells them, look, we need to get this into a person and that person needs to be an advocate for the technology. If need be, we'll start a letter writing campaign and I'm quite sure the FDA will let us move faster. The Elon Musk you describe in the story is always pushing to move forward, always trying to be more ambitious than any of the people who work for him think they can be, is very much the way he's operated his other companies. But you also write about a kind of tension about Musk himself, that lately his reputation has been a lot different than it was when he was sort of the hero of SpaceX and the hero of Tesla in those earlier days. Yeah, I mean, probably I might have watched this more than anyone as being his biographer and, and writing my book during kind of an earlier time in, in Elon's life. He's changed, you know, he's he's kind of a professional troll on Twitter. He seems to want to pick fights with people for sport. He's obviously all over the map politically and getting involved in world affairs. And so he's this mercurial wild card of a human with this particular technology. It's a brain implant. If you want to joke around, I don't even think it's joking. It's a mind control device that they want to put into literally billions of people one day. We've seen Elon in in the war in Ukraine with his space internet systems. You know, if he decides he doesn't want the Ukrainians to be using the space internet systems one weekend, he turns them off. And then so people talk to him and he turns them back on. I mean, there's a bit of very serious whimsy attached to all this. And so is this the most sort of stable, pragmatic, judicious guy that you want to be in control of a world of mind control devices? Probably not. Is he the person that will probably be the first to sort of make this happen? Yes. And so this is always the great conundrum with Elon, I think, and increasingly so. I mean, this is a field that he should know nothing about. Neuralink should not work. I mean, you don't just go into the biomedical field and start producing something like this and and have it work and and sort of race ahead of everyone when you've come from the car and the rocket and the internet software industry. And yet it is, it seems to be, we're on the cusp of this working. And so I think this is a great dilemma with Elon that we all have to deal with is this guy gets stuff done, but we don't always want him to be the one doing it. When we come back, Neuralink's testing on animals. Actually, maybe the most controversial part of Neuralink's operations has been testing on animals. And there's been a lot written about what's happened to some of the animals who've been used in developing this product. Absolutely. And just to give people a flavor for Neuralink's setup and how these animals play in, the company started in California. It has a headquarters in Fremont, which is on the edge of Silicon Valley. And in that facility, they've got pigs. They've got monkeys, uh, about almost 20 monkeys. And so these animals do get implants. They live at the Neuralink facility. They're watched. Their brain activity is red. And then in Austin, Texas, which I think is going to be the future home of Neuralink, they've bought 37 acres of former ranch land. And they already have about 100 sheep and pigs there in a barn. The hope is to have sort of a primate setup where the primates can be indoors and outdoors. That facility also has operating rooms where they have the robots to perform these surgeries, a lab to go over the samples and and everything. You know, the huge controversy around the animals has been that there's been reports um, gathered from public documents, from reporting that some of these surgeries have gone wrong, that pigs and the monkeys in particular have suffered as a result of the implant. Some of these stories, I have to give credit to, to Wired and Reuters. They've done most of the reporting here. They've suggested it was unnecessary suffering on parts of the animals. And the stories are hard to read, r- really hard. You know, you hear about, about monkeys being despondent, bleeding, scratching at these things. It's, it's, a tough, it's a tough read. 
We should say that Neuralink has said it's made mistakes during exploratory surgeries, but it says it was human error, not issues with its equipment. And the company stresses that the most troubling reports are from its early years before it built its own testing facility in Fremont. And Neuralink says it's gone to great lengths to provide better living conditions for the animals there. In 2020, Neuralink brought all of its animal testing and operation in-house. And, and so this was the Fremont facility and now the Austin facility. And so I'm the only reporter that has seen the stuff up hand. I don't want to be an apologist for Neuralink. All I can say is that, that the animals that I have seen over these three years are incredibly well cared for. And in fact, Neuralink is doing many pioneering things in terms of animal care that you would never see at a contract research facility. So what is different about the way Neuralink treats animals now? If you go into a contract research animal center, the something like monkeys are just going to be kept in rows of cages. They are not given really anything in their cage. The way that they're usually coaxed into doing a research experiment is by withholding their food and water until they do their work, and then it's given to them as a treat. At Neuralink, it's, it's just very different. I've seen the same group of 17 to 20 monkeys for the last three years. They've all had these brain implants. They, as far as my eyes indicate, are healthy and active. Neuralink has them in their, their kind of natural habitat, not like outside, but in their regular cages. Their cages are several times bigger than what you would find. At one of these research organizations, the animals volunteer to do the testing. They're like wheels, the laptops in front of them, and they're offered like a smoothie or some, some fruit to munch on while they do the experiment for a couple hours. And if they don't want to, they're free to leave. Neuralink doesn't bind them in any way. They just sit in their cage. Their cages are also full of toys. It looks like a child's playground. I mean, they have all the slides and things to play with. There's music playing through the whole room. There's TVs they can watch. It's just, it's very, very different to, to anything you would see at a contract research center. The monkeys that have been at the Fremont facility for the last three years, 17 of them that I've seen totally fine. They've been implanted. They've even had the implants taken out and been upgraded in some cases. There were two or three that did not take to doing the tests and, and just, just were not interested in doing the test. And so they were retired to a center that sort of takes care of retired animals. And there was one animal that was euthanized. Neuralink says it was part of a planned euthanization that, that happens at the end of some of these tests. What is Neuralink said about its animal testing when you ask them about it? To their credit, they go through detail by detail with me, and, and they've done some of this on their website as well, each of the incidents that's been reported. So Neuralink has been relatively upfront. They've been a very secretive company. Again, I'm the only reporter that's ever been allowed in there. I think they're very sensitive to the animal stuff. Elon adds to everything because, because he just brings this heightened scrutiny, and he is this guy that is hard charging and wants to go fast, and people want to know if there's consequences as a result of that. And you've talked to him quite a bit about Neuralink and the project. What does he say about it when you talk to him about his aim for this company? Well, I've always found it confusing, just like I find his position on AI in general to be confusing. I mean, he's the doom and gloomer when it comes to AI, and yet he's funded two AI startups, one of them OpenAI, which is the world's leading AI company. Tesla has some of the best and, and highest number of, of AI engineers in the world. And then Neuralink is this huge gamble. When you talk to Elon about this, I mean, he just does not see these two sides of the coin at all. I mean, it's, it's this very black and white issue for him. We will either become the AI's pets or we will evolve alongside of them. Ashley, you said that very soon Neuralink will begin its very first trial of the device. What happens next? Where does the company and this product, I suppose you'd call it, go from here? Yeah, so the trial, there isn't a specific date set yet, but it should happen within the next few weeks, or I would assume maybe early 2024. They've selected a couple of hospitals where they want to do this first implant in a human. They've opened up a call 
for participants. And so this first person is likely to be paralyzed in all four limbs, probably a pretty young patient because you generally want to be as healthy as possible for these types of trials. So this first person would get this implant in the relatively near future. They've had thousands of people knocking on their door to take part in this trial. And then obviously the FDA will be looking very closely to make sure the device is, is not causing any physical harm. That's kind of step one. And then you have this process where you begin to read out the data and see how well the device is working. Unlike with primates and other animals, you have this amazing moment where a human can actually tell you what this thing feels like, how well it's performing, give you much more direct feedback. If everything goes well, Elon turned out to be right about how the FDA was was perceiving these things. They've already been given approval to, again, things have to go right, but to do another implant about three months instead of a year after this first one. And so the company is looking to do about 11 implants in 2024, get up to maybe around like 50 the next year. And then I saw a slide deck that talked about tens of thousands of surgeries about five years into the future. Ashley, it was great talking to you. This is just fascinating. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks so much. By the way, if you want to keep up with the latest on Elon Musk, be sure to check out Bloomberg's new podcast called Elon Inc. Each week, hosts David Papadopoulos and a panel of Bloomberg journalists talk about Musk, his companies, and the surprising ways they intersect. Give it a listen. You can find Elon Inc. wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening to us here at The Big Take. It's a daily podcast from Bloomberg and iHeartRadio. For more shows from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen. And we'd love to hear from you. Email us questions or comments to bigtake at bloomberg.net. The supervising producer of The Big Take is Vicky Bergolina. Our senior producer is Catherine Fink. Zenob Siddiqui and Federica Romaniello produced this episode. Hilda Garcia is our engineer. Our original music was composed by Leo Sidrin. I'm Wes Kosova. We'll be back tomorrow with another Big Take. <laughs>